Hi everyone, thanks for stopping by. Today's topic is the result of a poll that I posted on the community tab for this channel a few weeks ago. I asked the question, what is it that you'd most like to see in future videos? Number one on that list was blind tasting, so you guessed it, today is a blind tasting day. As is always the case with blind tasting, I use something called funneling. And this was taught to me years ago when I made my way through the MW process. It's something I use on a regular basis, so really it's become a bit of, of muscle memory. But essentially what this is, is deductive reasoning. Now this can be used in a couple of different ways. Sometimes when you're analyzing a wine and you're taking a look at the way it looks, the way it smells, the way it tastes, the impression that it leaves on your palate, sometimes all the dots connect and it takes you to a specific grape variety and perhaps even a place of origin. Oftentimes that is not the case. Usually that pathway is gonna become quite muddled. In that case, what I'd like to do is to flip the equation over. And I'll start with a, a broad assortment of what a wine can be. And then based on all of the impressions I'm getting from the way the wine looks, the way it smells, tastes, and that tactile impression, it starts to get funneled down to the point where I get down to the conclusion. And at that point, I'll take a leap of faith but I'm trying to make all the pieces connect in a way that are logical and leads to a, a conclusion that in most cases, when it's a good day, it should be somewhat accurate. The wines selected for this tasting were chosen by a WSET student who's at the diploma level. Uh, I work with several people in that program. It's very good if you're not familiar with it, check it out, it's Wine Society Education Trust. They've got a great website. But typically the way things work is for an individual who makes their way through the diploma level, that is then part of the criteria to then enter the Master of Wine program. So I have two wines that have been poured for me about an hour ago. So they've had some time to aerate, to hopefully bring out the aromatics. What I'm being asked is to identify the grape variety or varieties, the place of origin, the vintage, and the price point, and I'm gonna state that in US dollars. Here are the two wines that I'm going to be blind tasting. In my left hand is wine number one. In my right is wine number two. And I think it's fairly obvious on this video that wine number two is much more pale in color. Therefore, I'm actually going to start with wine two, with the thought being this wine is going to have a bit less density to it. Uh, I'd like to start with the assessment on, on that wine and then move into the one that I feel is going to have more depth and, and more concentration to it. As you can see with this wine, it is not all that deep. Uh, it's fairly pale in color, but as you get out to the rim of the glass, there's no browning, there's no amber color there. So it would lead me to believe that this is a fairly youthful wine. The lack of color takes me down the path of some sort of thinner skin grape variety. Perhaps something like Gamay, Pinot Noir, maybe Sangiovese. It could be something like Tempranillo, maybe Grenache, uh, anything else. I think we're getting into some more obscure grape varieties, but just on the site alone, it's leading me down the path of something that's a bit of a thinner skin grape variety. Uh, there's some primary fruit there, a little bit of that, that strawberry red fruit character. There is a, a bit of, of oak as well. Uh, it's not all that distinctive in terms of aroma. So trying to connect the dots from what I'm thinking uh, could be the grape variety based on, on site to the aromatics. Right now, I'm, I'm not really making the link. In terms of the palate itself, there's some bright fruit. It's primary fruit. Uh, it has that youthful character. It's vibrant, really bright, clean, fruity. Uh, there is a bit of oak to it as well. I would say this wine is very youthful. Uh, my guess would be probably a 2020 vintage. There's not a lot of concentration to it. Uh, there's decent presence on the front palate. It falls off on the mid and back palate. It leads me to believe it's probably something that's more of a, a basic commercial level wine. This is not something that is uber artisanal. In terms of grape variety, uh, because of that strawberry fruit character, uh, it's making me think Pinot Noir would be the most obvious choice. Uh, something like Gamay oftentimes would be a little more overtly fruity. 
Sangiovese would oftentimes have a bit of an, an oranger uh, rim to it. This does not. Uh, Grenache, Tempranillo, uh, th this wine does not have the concentration for it, even though you can come across some Grenache that's going to be sort of in this style. But that strawberry fruit is making me think it, it is Pinot Noir. Now, in terms of place of origin, uh, I'm racking my brain on this. Uh, the most obvious place you think of with Pinot Noir is, is Burgundy in France. This has none of those characteristics whatsoever. And then I'm starting to tick through all these other places in the world that wine could come from. And uh, when I think of uh, the U.S., for instance, the, the West Coast with Oregon or, or California, I don't think this wine delivers the quality that you'll find in many of the wines from, from those regions. Within California, oftentimes Pinot Noir, it's, it's a little bit of alchemy going on behind the scenes. And oftentimes Pinot Noir from California may have a bit of Syrah into it. There's a little behind the scenes winemaking magic happening where the wines actually look a little deeper. Oftentimes the fruit's more overt. Uh, oftentimes also the alcohol level is a bit higher. I think this one's probably around 13-ish in, in alcohol. Uh, so I don't think this is coming from the U.S. When I think of other areas in Australia that, that make Pinot Noir, places like Adelaide Hills, uh, Mornington Peninsula, uh, Tasmania, this wine does not stack up to any of those in quality. Uh, the same would hold true for uh, New Zealand with Central Otago down in the south part of the South Island or Martinborough, which is the south part of the North Island. I don't think this wine stacks up to, to those either. Uh, Chile comes to mind as a possibility. There's a lot of cool growing regions, coastal regions within Chile that can make some very nice Pinot Noir. Places like Leda, San Antonio, uh, sometimes Casablanca can fit into that category as well. I don't think this has quite that character either. Those generally have a little bit more lifted aromatics and a little brighter acidity, and I'm, I'm not quite getting it in this wine. You know, this does not have a strong sense of place. So in terms of origin, uh, I'm going to take a bit of a flyer on this, and I am going to call this... Vin de France. Uh, Vin de France is a category that hasn't been around all that long, but essentially it's wines that can be sourced virtually from anywhere within the country of France. Uh, these are wines generally made for commercial, commercial style that are, are broad, uh, broad market type of wines. They're generally fairly inexpensive, but they, for the most part, lack a sense of place. So with this wine, I'm gonna go with a 2020 vintage Pinot Noir, uh, Vin de France, price point, 10 to $12. Go off to wine number two. First wine was a bit rough, so hopefully I can get myself back on track. Uh, looking at wine two, the color is deeper. The, the core is not quite opaque, but it, it definitely does have more color to it. As it extends out to the rim of the glass, there, there's a bit of fade maybe a slight ambery tone. So I, I do think maybe this wine has a bit of, of mileage to it. Wow, this is a massive wine. Uh, lots of oak, new oak, very smoky, charred, has that vanilla character. Uh, it's like you're walking through a lumber yard. It's, it's that much oak. Yeah, the fruit character is ripe. There's good intensity. Uh, there's, there's a black fruit character, a bit of a black olive, fennel. It's a little bit, uh, of, again, that, that smoky charred character. It is a big, dense sort of aromatic profile. Alcohol seems to be quite elevated. I'm not getting the heat from it, but you can tell this wine has, has got a, a very ripe character. And it appears to me that this is a wine that is using all the bells and whistles. I mean, it is tricked out with, uh, again, that, that new oak and fruit quality that is, is just excellent. Weighty, rich, very full. As I mentioned, the alcohol does seem quite high. I would say 14.5, maybe even a bit higher than that. It's not overly jammy, so 
that typically would lead to a more uh, warmer growing region. It doesn't have that, but certainly the fruit is very, very ripe. There, there's a lot of that phenolic ripeness to this wine. It's big, it's dense, it has a lot of structure. It, it has very good presence on the front, mid, and back palate. Great balance. It does have some uh, primary fruit character yet. Uh, there's certainly the secondary with the oak influence, and it does show some bottle age as well. So I, I think this wine has got uh, some age to it. I'm gonna say maybe five years or so, which would put it somewhere around 2018. Uh, the grape variety is something I, I'm really struggling with. Uh, I can't put my finger on any specific grape variety. Cabernet Franc came to mind, but it doesn't have any of that pyrazine note, that bell pepper, capsicum character. Typically Cabernet Franc, even riper versions of it, will have some level of pyrazine. I'm, I'm not getting that on this wine. It has none of the character that I would associate with anywhere in the New World. I can't see how this could be anywhere from, from the U.S., uh, certainly not a place like uh, New Zealand, Hawke's Bay. It doesn't fit that area at all. Australia, absolutely, I couldn't see. Maybe, uh, maybe Chile with some of the very upper-end reds, uh, possibly, uh, but those are typically going to be made from uh, Cap Sol, Merlot, maybe a bit of Cabernet Franc, uh, sometimes Melbeck or a bit of Carmenere. I don't think so. That seems to be a bit of a forced fit. Uh, same for, for Argentina. I don't see this fitting anywhere there. So my thought is this has to be some sort of European origin. In France, just going through the like mental Rolodex, uh, I can't see where this could be in France. It doesn't fit Bordeaux, doesn't fit Burgundy, certainly not Loire, not the Rhone, maybe somewhere in the Languedoc. It could be someone doing uh, something very much off the beaten path, perhaps the Languedoc. Portugal, I can't see it. Uh, a lot of the Portuguese wines, if they're made with a good amount of Tariga Nacional, the wines are going to have much more density of color. Uh, this has good color, but not quite to that level. And the big level of oak uh, would lead me away from Portugal, even though something like the Douro is possible, but the structure of this wine doesn't fit for that. That's really leaving me with two places. I'm thinking Spain or Italy. And going through Spain, many of the regions in Spain are, are very, very warm, and the wines tend to have a bit more of that jammy character. There are some cooler areas, but I I don't think so. I'm When in doubt, I always go back to Italy, and I'm going through the classic regions there with uh, Veneto. This certainly does not have any of the characteristics of Valpolicella, Rapassa, Amarone. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, Tuscany, again, I don't think so. The southern part of Italy with Apulia, you would not see this level of oak. It's putting me in a place like Piemonte. Uh, this is not Nebbiolo. I feel quite confident on that. Nebbiolo would have uh, a bit of a different color at the rim of the glass. The tannin would be higher. The acidity would be higher. And generally, there's, there's some cases where the oak would be very high like this, but this would be a bit of an anomaly. So I don't think it's, it's Nebbiolo, which would exclude Barbaresco, uh, Barolo, Gattinara, and so on. Based on, on the bright, fresh character of this wine, if I had to choose uh, for the purpose of, of this video, I'm thinking Barbera. Uh, there are some very top-end Barberas that will use a lot of oak. It has some of that characteristic. So if I, if I have to land on a, some end point here, I'm going to say this is Barbera 2018 Vintage. Uh, Piemonte, and this is an expensive bottle of wine. I'm going to say this is $60 plus. Well, we've made it to the point of the big reveal, and if you enjoy Freud, well, I think you've probably enjoyed this video a lot because I, I've really had a tough go at this today. Let's see what wine, uh, we're actually going to go with wine number two first. That was the one I called the Pinot Noir from uh, Vin de France, 2020 Vintage. 10 to 12 dollars and the reveal on this is okay this is uh yali reserva 
Pinot Noir 2021 from Casablanca in Chile. It shows a retail of about 16 US dollars. I know this winery. Uh, it, the winery is called Vina Ventisquero. Uh, it's an uber modern winery. It looks like a place where a James Bond movie could be shot. They make very modern style wines, very clean, correct style wines. I've got to say, I, I enjoy what they produce, but I think this one falls a bit short. Um, it does not have the Casablanca character that I would expect. Usually, again, more of an elevated acidity and brighter, fresher fruit. Uh, this one seems a little bit, a little bit muddled, and I, I, I'm not a huge fan of this wine. But I hit part of it. Uh, the other, in terms of place of origin, I was a half a world away. So not the easiest wine. The second wine, I'm feeling less confident than the first. This one, I'm calling a 2018 Barbera Piemonte, Italy. Higher price point around $60. This is a Soto del Vicario. This is from the Berzo region in Spain. This is from the northwest part of the country. Uh, it's a region that's very well protected on mountains on three of the four sides, slate-based soil. It's one of the cooler growing areas within Spain. In Anglo speak, the grape variety used there is Mencia. Uh, it shows it's a 2018 vintage uh, U.S. retail of $75, alcohol level of 14.5. There's also some small print on the back label. It shows 2,964 bottles produced, so minuscule production, vineyard planted in 1901. Uh, I would imagine this is the old bush prune vines, very gnarled, twisted vines, low yield, Generally, vineyards like this uh, produce wines with a massive amount of concentration to it. And it shows that the wine has 26 months in French oak. The bottle is heavy as a bowling pin. Uh, the punt is at least two inches deep. I would imagine they have a good $5 invested in just the bottle itself. The wine is a beauty. I don't think this is typical of what you find in the region. Usually the wines have a little more fruit, a bit less, less oak but this wine can support that oak wonderfully. Later today, I'll tell you, I'm not gonna be drinking the Pinot Noir, I'm gonna be drinking the Spanish wine. Well, you saw a rough tasting day here. You saw things just the way they play out. The funneling process generally does lend to a good result. Uh, with this last wine, it, it went sideways, these things happen. But I do appreciate you staying to the end of the video. Thank you for your support of this channel. If you have any comments, post them down below. I'll be sure to follow up. And until next time, I'll be somewhere out in the wine world. Cheers.